killer whales make killing look easy. It isn't. The secret to their success is that they do everything together as a family. It takes a young killer whale 15 years or more to learn the complicated hunting techniques and other life skills from its mother. These whales develop as slowly and live as long as us. Thanks to the French scientists who've concentrated on this one family for more than 20 years, we're beginning to understand just how much time and effort the whole family put into teaching their young. This playful little female, Delphine, is already 14. She has one more summer in which to learn to become a killer. Our family spend the summer halfway between the tip of South Africa and Antarctica, patrolling the shores of the Crozet Islands. This inhospitable no man's land, nothing more than a few small volcanic outcrops, lies in the path of the Roaring Forties. On bad days, winds race unchecked around the open oceans, reaching 120 miles an hour until they crash into these islands, whipping the waves into a frenzy. The only respite from this battering is found on a few sheltered beaches, favored by king penguins and elephant seals. But any landfall is treacherous for a young killer whale. It's Delphine. She's in serious trouble. Her cries are already weak. She barely has the strength to lift her tail. She must refloat herself or die from dehydration. In her short lifetime, several crozet whales have perished this way. At 14, Delphine is the youngest female in her family. Perhaps it was the rough surf or curiosity over the penguins which tempted this adventurous female too close to the land. Whatever the reason, her family will not desert her. Those pitiful cries bring them racing to her side. Her mother, Lison, is much larger and risks her own life by coming in so close. Delphine must do more than cry. She has to help herself. Almost nose to nose, her mother encourages her. Lison raises her dorsal fin, showing Delphine what she must do. And slowly, Delphine arches her body. But the surf keeps pushing her in. She tries harder, hunching with all her strength. Lison wills her on, and gradually, caterpillar-like, Delphine shuffles forward. They can almost touch. Lison swings her own tail round to join her daughter, side by side, keeping her going. She's free. The whole family gather round to greet her and join in the noisy celebration. Delphine's free spirit has got her into trouble many times before. As a tiny calf, she was stranded and rescued by the French scientists. Since that day, the whole family have trusted divers unusually close. Scientists are not supposed to be anthropomorphic, yet they can't help but agree that Delphine is easily the most impetuous, wayward and spirited member of this playful family. Luckily, her mother is a stabilizing influence. 
Recognizable by the star pattern on her dorsal fin, Lison is nearing 50, an experienced matriarch and leader. The other large female, Venus, is either her daughter or younger sister. At four years old, her calf, Junior, is still the baby of the family. And they all take turns at looking after him. The fifth member of this family group, or pod, is Rodion, recognizable by a dorsal fin that is as tall as a man. He's Lison's eldest son, and reached sexual maturity more than a decade ago. In most other mammal societies, sons leave the family to avoid inbreeding. Yet 30-year-old Rodion stays with his mother. How Rodion avoids mating with his mother and sister is one of many mysteries which may only be solved by long-term studies such as this. Despite Rodion's superior strength, he always defers to his mother's leadership. If Lison has a problem child, it's Delphine. Soon she too will reach sexual maturity and have the responsibility of a calf of her own. Yet there are several crucial life skills which is not yet mastered. It's high time Delphine knuckled down to school. This excitable youngster has to learn to keep silent and listen. She must become familiar with the natural rhythm of the surf. Then, when something splashes, she'll note the subtle changes in tempo. Today, Delphine can see the penguins clearly. But when the water is turbulent, when she's hunting, she must recognize penguins not by sight, but by their unique underwater signature tune. Easily bored, Delphine's already beginning to play. She's lost concentration. And something important, something she should have been listening for, slips through. The elephant seals are returning to their breeding beach after eight months at sea. They're the reason several families of killer whales come to the Crozets for the summer. Over the next few months, the seals will keep a wary eye out for the black blades patrolling the shoreline. But for the moment, the males have other preoccupations. Only one can be Beachmaster. If veteran teeth won't intimidate those young upstarts, then the only way to win the beach is to fight. is mating rights to as many females as one male can keep track of. But these females are already heavy with pup. They mated with last year's beach master. They won't let the new master near them until their pups are born and about three weeks old. The veteran may have won the beach and a harem of over 30 females. But he can neither mate nor feed. He's forced to play a long, slow waiting game. The killers can't afford to wait. The family need at least one seal a day to keep going. Calling in a dialect that's unique to the Crozet whales, Lison gathers her family together and leads them off to investigate another bay. 
She spent over 40 years learning every nook and cranny of this coastline. She must pass this knowledge on to her family and leads them on a short cut through the seaweed. Delphine begins to lag behind. She can't help but be distracted by the gentle sway of the ribboning fronds. She's playing again. An underwater grotto beckons and she takes a wrong turn. She gives the family contact call. There's no reply. Swimming faster to catch up, she finds herself in a thick bed of giant kelp. Delphine is well and truly lost in this maze. She cries for help, but is met by a wall of silence. For a young killer whale, whose world is normally full of the reassuring sounds of its family, this silence must be similar to being shut in the dark. Delphine cries again, repeating this specific distress call, which will carry, even through the seaweed, for three miles or more. But a family were cruising at around 10 miles an hour. They could easily be out of range. They turn as one, so they've heard something. Instinctively, Lison knows which of her charges is missing. They race towards Delphine's distress signal. For the second time in two short weeks, they're on a mission to rescue the most wayward member of their family. Lison relies on the fact that one of the many lessons she has taught her capricious daughter has stuck. When lost, stay still. Only if Delphine remains in one place can Lison track her cries to their source. After two long hours, they're reunited. Despite Delphine's habit of getting into trouble, she gets a welcome fit for a hero. These whales are extremely sociable. They'll use any excuse to party. they rejoice because the danger of losing one of the family is always real. Only a few years ago, an adult female disappeared from the group in mysterious circumstances. As the family celebrate, Junior tugs at the seaweed. The same weed which so nearly trapped his young playmate. Summer has truly arrived in the Crozet Islands. But at 10 degrees Celsius, it's as warm as it gets for the sunbathers on this beach. The beach master is still waiting, but his females are at last giving birth. Skewers and sheath bills gathering expectantly around a female are a sure sign that a pup is on its way.
the skewers are tolerated by the weary female, provided they stick to cleaning up. Before the pup gets its first drink, it must reply to its mother's call so that they can always find each other on the busy beach. The female's done the hard work, but the male seems the more exhausted. It's a good job someone's disturbing his slumber. There's an imposter in camp. The defeated bachelor males are constantly on the lookout for a chance to sneak in. The masters spotted him. Not one, but two intruders to deal with. It's a rare display of energy. And Lison's family is ready just in case. During the breeding season, the adult seals don't feed, but they sometimes use the sea to escape from fights. This female has only just reached sexual maturity. With no pup to keep her close to the others, she's the chance the bachelors have been waiting for. Beach master wins her, but in his excitement can't wait. Another few seconds and they'd both be clear of the dangerous surf. Lison and Delphine dive under cover. Further out, Rodion and Junior allow themselves to be seen. Tiny Junior spy hops, playing his part in the distraction routine. Females stalk the seals in silent formation, perfectly hidden until Delphine steals a quick breath. But the seals, too busy to notice, are like sitting ducks. Lison's fin breaks the surface too soon. It's dangerously shallow. She dare not risk her daughter stranding again. They turn away, making sure the couple can see them departing. The coast seems clear. Perhaps this inexperienced female chooses the sea to avoid getting caught up in another fight. Lison's battle cry lets the family know she is launching her attack. She had it, but a heavy seal is difficult to manage alone. She's trying to force the seal out to a depth that's safe for the rest of her family. Only once she's away from the surf does she call urgently for reinforcements. Delphine mimics her mother as she tries to stun the seal.
With amazing coordination, the three females are almost juggling the seal. As one pushes it under, another is there to catch and toss it, to prevent it falling too far. In deeper water, whales can easily lose their catch. They could probably kill it more quickly, but like a cheetah mother dropping a gazelle for her cubs, they need to give Delphine all the practice they can. It's over, and Lison calls for her boys. Rodion and his mother take turns to hold the carcass so that the other can tear at the flesh. Then, while Lison holds the body, Venus breaks off a bite-sized chunk so that she can feed Junior. It's a powerful bond. Four years old and still dependent on his mother to pop food into his mouth. Finally, Delphine has allowed her share. She's found a last piece of fin. There's only just enough to go around. Taking turns to feed avoids noisy squabbling which might alert neighboring pods to their catch. Some giant petrels have no such qualms. Their splashing distracts the ever curious Delphine. She should be looking for scraps while she can. Ten minutes after death, there is nothing left for the sea to claim. Just around the headland, hundreds of king penguins are making landfall after weeks of feeding far out in the open ocean. They breed at different times, so some are returning to feed last year's chick, while others have come to swap roles with the partner they left behind incubating their egg. After a long separation, finding one's partner might seem like a daunting task, especially when faced with over 20,000 lookalikes. Fortunately, penguins don't need to pick a face from the crowd. They recognize each other by a unique whistle. And luckily, they find their chicks the same way, for they've now outgrown their parents. Penguin chicks are fed for a whole year by one parent or the other before they're fat enough to face the hostile ocean. The elephant seal pups have only three weeks to build up their fat reserves from their mother's milk. Drinking around seven liters of milk a day, they've already tripled in size. The killers are out there, but until the pups begin to play in the surf, there's little chance of a meal. As dusk begins to fall, Rodion and the others follow the matriarch to one of her favorite haunts. Aww. 
seal hunters who came here in Lison's grandmother's time told of whales that could be found at this spot. In turn, Delphine will pass the knowledge on to her grandchildren. That is, assuming the playful Delphine ever reaches such maturity. This is where Lison takes time out from family responsibilities. She can drift in the current, allowing the seaweed to massage her back. Delphine examines the rock face. She must be careful not to cut her sensitive skin, but a gentle pumice stone-like scrub will help get rid of any itch. But these gestures are purely playful. Everyone who's watched this family is convinced that they come simply to relax and enjoy the sensations. Sometimes they spend up to six hours here in a seemingly dreamlike state. Whales don't sleep, but they can shut off half their brain while the other half takes care of breathing and staying afloat. Tonight, while the killers are away relaxing, penguins and seals can safely play and court in the moonlit shadows. The respite is brief. Since dawn, Delphine has been up cruising the same shallows. She's practicing the silent listening technique, but this time she's listening for seals. For these adult seals, the starvation period is nearly over. Soon, they'll be leaving their pups and heading out to sea. The seals and their pups spend more and more time at the water's edge. Delphine has to learn to keep her dorsal fin hidden. She positions herself behind the sand step. But since she was stranded, this is the closest Delphine's been to the shore on her own. If she's ever going to help her family and take a seal pup from the surf, she must learn how to beach. Sensibly, the pup leaves the water, but it would have been okay. The family has other plans for Delphine. Choosing the perfect calm morning, the whole family unite behind Delphine, forcing her closer and closer towards the beach. For Delphine, this must be the toughest lesson of all. There is no escape. Venus stays back to block her exit, while Lison, like a parent urging a reluctant child down a slide, pushes Delphine right to the edge. She's beached. That was relatively easy. Getting off again is the difficult part. She attempts to struggle free. Lison and Venus close in around her, forcing her to lie still and accept the strange sensation of solid land beneath her body.
Finally, she's allowed to try and escape. She must learn to arch and wriggle her body while at the same time turning sideways so that she can roll off the gentle slope. She's off and heads away from shore quickly, just in case Lison has other plans for her. By midday, the surf is up again. The whales have missed the seal exodus, so they focus on the penguins. Unlike the seals, the penguins are in and out of the sea all day long. They're agile swimmers, twisting and turning far more easily than the larger whales. Once again, Delphine must master her family's special technique. Porpoising penguins have their own unique beat, and Delphine picks out the tune above the natural rhythm of the sea. Way offshore, Rodion is shadowing the same group. It's difficult for someone who's been at school all morning to contain her excitement. Delphine shows herself too soon. But the boys are ready. They drum the water, blocking the escape to the open sea and creating panic. Penguins race for the rocks, but there aren't enough to go round. Delphine has a chance to prove herself now. But she hovers uncertainly. Lison and Venus show her how it's done. The trick is to focus on one individual and not be distracted by the frenzy. Venus makes the first hit. But she doesn't kill the penguin outright, perhaps to give Delphine the chance to strike. Delphine also has to learn how to eat penguin properly. Otherwise, she'll get nothing more than feathers up her nose. The best technique is to squeeze the meat out of the body. It takes a lot of practice to get anything worth having. Each bird provides little more than a snack. The remains, an empty bag of skin and feathers, fall to the seabed. The family catch up to 25 birds each time they launch a panic attack, and the bottom is littered with the carnage. It's the height of summer, yet in this desolate outpost, weather from all four seasons can pay a visit on the same day. The sudden drop in temperature is brutal. Even the penguins appear to be feeling the cold. (coughs) 
The whales are protected by the more constant temperature of the sea, but their warm breath in the freezing air gives away their position to any watching seals. In the calm after the storm, the excited commotion of another killer whale pod carries clearly. Lison's family recognize the dialect. They know who is calling, and they probably know why. They waste no time giving chase. Unusually, they're led by Rodion. He can race up to 25 miles an hour. The adult females travel more slowly, keeping Delphine and Junior firmly in their midst. All the pods around the crozets are small, with typically five to eight members. Cries like these usually mean that a pod has spotted larger prey than it can cope with and needs reinforcements. Just ahead of Rodion, a pod of seven whales is in hunting formation. The scavenging seabirds indicate that they have already made at least one kill. They're still calling for help, but Rodion is distracted by something lying in their wake. It's the remains of a minky whale calf. The other pod must have left it to carry on chasing its mother. Surprisingly, Rodion nuzzles at the carcass. There are no previous records of these efficient predators bothering to scavenge. He's trying to pick it up, perhaps to drag it to the approaching females. It's almost as if he needs his mother's approval. Lison swims down to investigate. And appears to approve. Recorded on camera for the first time, there is no doubt that our killers are scavenging. Perhaps this behavior is so unusual simply because most carcasses disappear quickly into the depths, whereas this calf was killed in the shallow, sandy area. The fact that these killers changed course to accept a free lunch is another sign of their superior intelligence. Rather than turn down a golden opportunity, they adapt their behavior accordingly. During the chase, they were noisy enough to attract all the killers in the neighborhood. Unwilling now to share these lean pickings, the family feed in unusual, eerie silence. Delphine had to be the one to disturb the peace. As if to teach her a lesson, Lison drags the carcass away from her daughter, towards the others. Cautiously, Delphine approaches again. And this time she keeps quiet.
It takes the family another half hour to pick the bones clean. So far, Delphine has managed to contain herself. But as usual, she's the first to let off steam. Back at the beach, the snow has melted, the adult seals have long gone, and with no parents around to chide them, the youngsters are having fun. Except perhaps for this pup. These pups have been left to their own devices while their puppy fat turns into the blubber needed to cope with the cold ocean. With no parent around, there's no one to tell this penguin to pick on someone his own size. Nor to warn the pup that it's better to face up to pesky penguins than meet the black blades out at sea. Only Delphine is close enough to intercept the pup. But for once she's concentrating so hard she's not distracted. She's practicing beaching all by herself. Soon the pups will be leaving and the opportunity to catch one will be lost for another year. Next year Delphine will be old enough to have her own calf. If she's to pass this difficult technique on, she's got to get it right. On and off. She seems pretty confident. Confident enough to tease and chase the penguins close inshore. Perhaps in this last summer, free from responsibility, Delphine simply enjoys playing the child. In the river which flows into the bay, the seal pups have found a safe place to practice their swimming skills. They too have turned their lesson into a game. One of their favorite games is to let the current sweep them downstream. before paddling up to begin again. These joy riders have no idea that every year a few of the most daring pups get swept out beyond the point of no return. Lison's seen it all before and has called Delphine into position to listen and wait. While the rest of the family remain hidden, it's the impulsive Delphine who once again blows their cover. She swims away. If these pups stay on the beach, they'll starve. Sooner or later, they have to run the gauntlet.
Venus gives chase. And Lison closes the trap. The rest of the family are there to help, but there's no sign of Delphine. She has ignored the sound of her family feeding. Foolhardy as ever, she's attempting to go it alone. Her aim is good, but she may have got more than she bargained for. She calls for reinforcements. Suddenly, her mother is by her side. Delphine's exaggerated tail thrash says it all. For the first time, she has provided something for the rest of her family. After a long childhood, Delphine has finally become a killer. With her help, the whales will feast well for the next few weeks. Then, sometime in the coming winter, Delphine may well find herself a mate. How will she choose him? Will she have to tame that adventurous spirit for a long, serious courtship? Or do these whales flirt briefly, mate, then part? These are some of the many questions still to be answered. For the only bond which ties the whales to the land is the seals. When they've gone, the whales simply disappear back into their element. Our intimate encounter with Delphine lasts only as long as the summer. Until they appear around the headland again, we can guess that this close-knit family will keep a careful watch on Delphine. But it is only a guess. For more than seven months of the year, we have no idea what this family get up to. We don't even know where they're heading.